Okay, folks, I am about to tweet the beginning of this session, which makes it official. Um, that's a sarcastic comment, sorry. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to be talking to at Martin Wolf, um, the uh, world's most distinguished economic journalist, and a hell of a lot more than that. I am uh, honored and personally pleased to get this opportunity. We only have a half hour, so I'm not going to list Martin's 92 books and 72 honorary degrees, but I will start right in because I know the Martin groupies are here to hear him talk. L let me ease into our depth, into our dive into your psyche by starting with substance. We, we, we heard President Obama last night say that the U.S. economy is well, is healed. Um, have we really solved the fundamental things that started the crisis, not just in the U.S., but elsewhere? Are there issues outstanding that still trouble you? I think the answer, uh, given in my most recent book, and I'm sure that's really why you're, why you're all here, um, the shifts and the shocks, is the answer to the question is no. Uh, in, uh, and I'll state this in two <laughs> ways, two aspects, very, very briefly. Um, it was my view that, and I'm certainly not the only person who had this view, but I had the view that uh, the crisis was caused in substantial measure by the need, as it was perceived by the major central banks, particularly the Federal Reserve, to run really very accommodating monetary policies in the long period running up to the uh, crisis in response to significant uh, global uh, shortfalls in demand. And the, uh, those were generated in, in a number of different ways, both internal to our economies and globally. And it seems to me those underlying conditions clearly haven't gone. And one indicator of that is that even now, in what is supposed to be a period of healing, uh, the Fed is still pursuing, by any normal standards, fantastically accommodating monetary policy. And the second, uh, so, and I'm particularly concerned in that regard, by the way, that one aspect of that, the desire of everybody else, almost all other countries, to balance their economies by having a huge export surplus with the US is returning. We can see that returning now. Just look at what's, everybody is really congratulating themselves on collapsing their currency against the dollar. Uh, uh, um, so that's the first point. And the second point is uh, that those monetary policies interacted with a very fragile, liberalizing, very innovative and very unstable financial system. Um, to, to create a monstrous financial crisis. And while there have been some improvements in the financial sector, it still seems to me, in many respects, extremely fragile. Mm -hmm. And in some respects, possibly even more fragile than it was before the crisis began. I don't want to lose that because, of course, not just your writing, but your service on the Banking Commission in the UK, you have a lot to say on that issue. Um, but before we leave the, the global issue, um, my friends, our friends in the central banking community tend to say, unless we really screw up, monetary policy only affects the economy over the next couple of years. When you're talking about these very large shifts, these global imbalances, it has to do with savings rates, with demographics, with you know, the savings glut that Ben Bernanke spoke about. You're putting the blame, it sounds like, primarily on monetary policy choices. No, no, I'm, I, I don't think, I actually didn't explicitly didn't put the blame in my book because I think they had very limited alternatives mm -hmm. uh, given where they were uh, in that very, very long period. They were, they had uh, obligations to, to maintain inflation at a certain level, which meant maintaining demand at a certain level in their economies. And given what was going on in the uh, real sector, what you call fundamental savings and investment across the world, uh, they, the way they found to do that involved, as I said, pursuing a highly accommodating policy which generated a temporary but longer than two years credit boom. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the idea that, that monetary policy is neutral over anything over two years seems to me clearly wrong. Uh, it has very substantial effects well beyond those sorts of periods. 
Though in the long run, of course, I accept it doesn't determine the, the underlying trend, real growth of the economy, which is driven by productivity, innovation, all the things that Ned Phelps writes about uh, since he's here. Uh, but the, I think one of the lessons we've learned is that real economy disequilibria, uh, particularly in the balance at the global level between savings and investment, can be such that the monetary policy response, the need to, uh, to sustain demand leads, works through the credit system in highly destabilizing ways. And this is, I think, in a core way, the lesson I've learned from my admittedly much too recent reading of work of uh, Hyman Minsky on exactly these relationships. Well, I, I, as you know, you and I, and of course, obviously, my opinion is far less influential, but you and I have disagreed in that I believe the fragility of the financial system, in a sense, was the key factor uh, in amplifying and creating the crisis beyond these other factors. That may be me just making excuses for central bankers. But you did set it up that you are worried that the financial system, even after Dodd-Frank, even after the Financial Stability Board, even after poor Jamie Dimon has been tormented by his pursuers, is not as resilient as you might hope. Is that a fair statement? That is correct. And the, and the interact, and we are still using, of course, and this is a legitimate criticism, but it's a problem. The financial sector is still the way through which uh, the central banks, who are now continue to pursue highly expansionary policies uh, in one way or the other, are trying to affect the, uh, the level of demand in our economies. What is the worry about the financial sector from my perspective? from my perspective. Well, first of all, it's, in essence, it's the same financial sector. It's very clear. Nothing fundamental has right. changed in it. Um, in terms of banking institutions, on balance in most of the economies I am familiar with, it's become more concentrated than before um, because there's so many yes. disappeared. Uh, so if we had a too big to fail problem before, we clearly have a bigger too big to fail problem now. We have reduced leverage somewhat as properly measured. Uh, but, and I looked at this very recently, the, the, the leverage ratio, the proper leverage ratio, not on risk-weighted basis, I'll come to that in a moment, of uh, the world's major banks, uh, the, the globally significant international banks, is in the neighborhood of 20 and 25 to 1, between 20 and 25 to 1. So, it, it, since this is an incredibly knowledgeable audience, you can all work out pretty easily how much their, value, their assets need to decline in value before they're gone. It ain't very much. And, and, and that because I constantly remind people that the shock, the objective shock that caused such an enormous turmoil in the last, in 2007 and 8, was really quite a small one. Right. I and mean, it was just uh, uh, losses related to property, particularly in the US, not a huge global event. We could imagine much bigger ones. So we have, uh, we, ha we continue, so we have this leverage problem. We continue to li rely on risk weighting. Um, I understand why we rely on risk, risk weighting, but the experience we've had, to put it mildly, is that our ability to model risk appropriately ex ante is very, very limited. This is partly because, of course, the data is by definition incomplete uh, because we don't know what the future, uh, future uh, holds. But even worse, again, a Minsky point, um, the very perception that something is low risk tends to generate behavior that makes it riskier. Mm -hmm. This is stability destabilizes. It's a very, very powerful point. And the last point I would make is a huge part, I think, of the crisis was the fundamental um, non-transparency of the balance sheets right. of banks. And I have, I'm here, I'm not a, an enormous expert, of course I'm not, but I talk to a lot of people about this in the sense that when you consider the immense derivatives exposures uh, of the banking sector, um, their, their global asset structures which continue, um, the idea that either regulators or indeed investors or outside funders can have a really good idea of the uh, of the resilience of these institutions under unknown stresses, I think, is, is very naive. So it seems to me that, in essence, this remains a very fragile system, and a fragile system can fall apart at any moment. That's what was the great shock to me right. of 2008, 2007, 2008.
See, and again, if I, we were living in the pre-modern era, I would be holding up a hard copy of the shifts and the shocks, but it is available as an e-book, so just imagine the shifts and the shocks is here. You can buy it. Um, I mean, the shifts and the shocks is very much a work of economic analysis and synthesis, but since this, this conversation is meant to give us an insight into your unique personality and insight, let me ask you a bit about the political side. I mean, sitting there in the UK, and I was overlapping with you for part of this period, we had people, including not just you, not just me, Lord King at the Bank of England, Lord Turner running around at the FSA, saying things that were very radical about the banking system. And we have a system in the UK where, as you said, it, it's gotten incredibly concentrated. There are four major banks, one major mutual lender, and that's it. Um, why do you one think... One foreign bank. Right. Right. But they're, they're playing nice. Um, why do, you, why do you think with that much people in positions of prominence, positions of authority, at least with pulpits, you, Lord King, others, saying this, why do you think there was so little change? I mean, John Vickers' commission, which you served on, why did you think? Well, I think the answer to that uh, is, first of all, there has been, I, as I said, I didn't wish that I have a long section in the book on this, and there have been quite a lot of changes. I'm not trying to imply that nothing happened, something has happened. Uh, we played a role in this because uh, uh, the Vickers Commission, of which I was a part, of it, um, made the recommendation of essentially splitting our banking sector into the global trading arms and the domestic retail sector. This was particularly important for the UK because our banks are incredibly big, but most of their assets are foreign assets. Right. They're not domestic. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite statistics, which I think may, might still surprise some people in the audience, and, but I didn't know it, that when we went into the crisis in 2007, the aggregate balance sheet of the British banking sector was almost as large as the aggregate balance sheet of the American bank balance, banking sector. Now, that's partly because the Americans' banks in, ba in America, as we know very well now, uh, the shadow banking thing, right. as it's called, had grown so vast uh, and it's partly because our banks were globally so gigantic. So we went into the crisis with a banking balance sheet five times GDP, mm -hmm. uh, which put us almost in closer, much closer to Iceland than to America, which was pretty nerve-wracking. So we made the decision that the least bad thing we could do is to separate out the bit of the balance sheet that really, on which the economy clearly depended on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got this frighteningly concentrated banking sector, which I hate, but clearly if that falls over, then there isn't an economy. Um, ben Bernanke's famous remark uh, when he was asked what would happen if they just let all the banks go, he said, well, then there won't be an American economy on Monday morning. Uh, well, this is certainly true for us. Um, so we wanted to separate them out. Uh, and that is the one significant reform we've carried out. But we couldn't go any further um, for, uh, I think, essentially two reasons. The first reason was a very, very strong feeling by the political and economic establishment that, that our, as it were, that it was necessary that our banking sector remain globally competitive, quote unquote, which meant, which meant that they had to be at least as unsafe as all other banking right. sectors. Yeah. And so we couldn't go very far beyond the international consensus. So this has been, generally, the, the whole discussion of regulation and rules and frameworks has been a sort of the speed of the slowest. Right. And every country has some area that it doesn't want to tighten up on. So the end, end tends to be that we all agree not to tighten up very much anywhere. Yeah. So that was very important. And the British government was absolutely clear in the terms of reference to the Commission that we had to take account of, quote unquote, the competitiveness of the banking right. sector, which worked out pretty quickly to the statement that we couldn't demand any more capital right. or than we could right. really of any other uh, than was going to be demanded in any other international sector. So the pulling out the, the, the retail sector, which is a sort of Glass-Steagall right. approach, was the most radical we thought we could be. This feeling that here you've got this incredibly important, unbelievably important global industry, uh, and each country is very concerned to preserve the competitiveness of its b bit of it, against everybody else, which meant, as I said, allowing them all to operate at least as, as unsafe as one another, unsafe as one another, which of course has been again used. You, you mentioned a very distinguished American banker, I won't mention his name, but he has not infrequently argued that 
some regulation that the Americans are threatening to impose upon the American banks is quote-unquote un-American because it will put them at some notional disadvantage to, to, right. to some continental uh, entity which might be on the on the very edge of di disaster. So that is the answer to what happened. No, no, it's very helpful. But I mean, I just want to underline a couple things from what you said. I mean, because obviously on this point, I completely agree with you. I gave a speech while at the Bank of England complaining about the fetish of banking national champions. I compared it to rice in Japan and cars in Germany. It's just UK's national fetish. But the 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 thing I want you to consider that the, you said that's very interesting is. The UK establishment was against this. Now, this is therefore an establishment that somehow didn't include the chief commentator at the Financial Times or the governor of the Bank of England, and yet the establishment was against this. And so, I just, I just, it, it's interesting as we sit here at Davos and think about ideas to figure out who the true establishment is. But, but I think there's also a substantive point that I want to pursue with you. Um, one of the big arguments right now is over this shadow banking issue. And there are some regulators, and, and I think they have a point, who, who say, actually, this is kind of what we wanted. We wanted to make the banking system smaller versus the rest of the economy. We wanted the, insured, the explicitly insured sector to be less the risky part. And I'm going to oversimplify, but one could argue that part of the reason the US did better than the UK was because it may have been the same amount of credit boom, but it actually wasn't all in the banking system. It wasn't all in just a few banks. And so, you know, in your comment, you sort of seem to elide that and say, credit, and this is also a Minsky point, the credit booms are credit booms, credit booms are bad. But actually, maybe it matters a great deal, the structure of the financial system. And how do you feel about yeah, that? Yeah, I think it does. And we, there we've got some very interesting trade-offs. Uh, I think the US problem, looking back on it, was, to my sense, is that having this large, quote-unquote, sh let's leave aside the fact that there was a hell of a lot, let's be very, very clear, mm -hmm. which I think was more or less uniquely American, not entirely, mm -hmm. uh, of straightforward fraud going on. Absolutely. So leave that aside. In this crisis, I don't mean uniquely American, we, uh, we uh, I mean, the, 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 the subprime story doesn't have a British equivalent right. in the same form. That, um, a uh, little bit in Iceland, but I mean, not on the... So there's a special feature of what happened in the shadow banking. But in and of itself, the great advantage of the shadow banking structure is a lot of it could collapse. Mm -hmm. The difficulty it ha presented, and this is a really big issue here, which was, there, which is obvious, logical, there wasn't a clean distinction between the two. So a hell of a lot of stuff uh, that turned out to be very, very problematic which was, it, as it were, shadowy, I mean, sieves, conduits, mm -hmm. and all the rest of it, which were attached to major banking institutions, uh, either actual retail banks, bank holding companies, or bank holding companies which essentially were broker dealers, yeah. um, and therefore were, were systemically significant, were also deeply invested in and connected to the so-called shadow system. Now, I think it's very, uh, and, and that also arose in the, another aspect of it, the, the link with the, between the mutual funds and mm -hmm. all this. So one of your problems is, okay, you've got this core banking sector in the US, which it's clear you really care about. You're not going to let collapse completely. You, c you have relatively efficient resolution procedures. That also was a, another big yes. plus the US had. Nobody else, we had no resolution right. procedures at all. So that is a big improvement, by the way. Oh, at least it's an improvement. How big? I don't know, but it's an improvement. Uh, but the, the, uh, uh, when it came to the breakdown, the US problem was that it was really difficult to separate the shadowy stuff with the non-shadowy, the, the core stuff. So the, the poor old Fed basically had to go out in a way that really no other central bank and was shoring up everything everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you got into this really weird situation, which I, I like to joke about, which was that the whole housing finance system ended up being completely incorporated within the Fed, right. effectively, which nobody else had to do to the same degree. So that was the American problem. The British problem was quite different. We didn't have those relationships. We lost, an in, but, and it, but it emerged in another way. So I'm not sure which is better. I'm really at the moment not sure which is better. The British problem was we got incredible amount of losses on foreign assets. Right. We, the British banks lost vastly more on their lending in America to American housing than they lost 
on British housing, which again is very, very surprising to many people. But obviously the, the Bank of England didn't have a clue about what was going on there. So it's the whole foreign asset side of it, which is very non trans uh, very, very non transparent. But of course the other problem was since some, one of the institutions which was deeply involved in that was RBS as a result of its takeover of ABN AMRO. That, and it's a huge core bank and we couldn't just lose it. They ended up having to take over right. the whole thing. So my feeling at the moment is that shadow banking sectors which are deeply intertwined with core banking sectors are very fragile. And very big banking sectors, which operate globally, which don't have any shadow in, are also very fragile. I and I think it's very difficult yeah. to know ex ante which is going to be the more, more explosive. That's interesting. And it's great when you admit you're not sure yet. Um, it's good for all of us to think about. Let me, let me try to take this in a slightly different direction now. Um, one of the best things in your book, The Shifts and the Shocks, and again, I'm holding up the virtual cover for all of you. Buy it now. Um, in my opinion, as I've told you, is your section on how the economics profession just got it wrong. And, and you know, you have been a sparring partner and friend to most of the leading financial macroeconomic economists for the last several decades, or at least last couple decades. Um, why do you think they got it so wrong? Um, is it, was it a cognitive capture thing? Was it a fear of challenging the consensus? Was it more venal motivations? I mean, again, it wasn't 100% everyone got it wrong, but an <laughs> awful lot of the people who were economists speaking at Davos through the years got it wrong. Financial liberalization was going to save the world. So why do you think they got it wrong? Well, one of the reasons I'm very sympathetic to them is that I did too. So I was... I was hoping you were going to say uh, that, so, but I left it to you to so say that. I, it's in the first page of the book, so, uh, which is perhaps a good... One commenter on Amazon said, why should I read a book by a person who admitted he was wrong? I think that's a very good question. Uh, maybe the answer is that learning in one's mistakes is one of the ways human beings learn. Uh, um, it was a, I wouldn't say it was universal, uh, but a lot of people got this wrong. And I think, um, I, don't, I don't think venality was a big element in it. Uh, I think there were... Uh, a mixture of intellectual and historical reasons. The intellectual reason was that as the profession of economics developed uh, over the last 40 years after the collapse of simple-minded Keynesianism, um, the, the, the new syntheses were increasingly around uh, ideas of general equilibrium in, uh, and with a few imperfections or not, which basically said, provided you maintain, uh, I'm just trying to simply, right. monetary stability in some sense, you don't do something, anything crazy. And some people would argue, even that doesn't matter, money is completely irrelevant. But assume that you think you need some sort of monetary stability, the economy is going to just sort of look over to itself and it'll be fine. There's, there's nothing to worry about. It can't, th those were inherent in the models, the way the models structured. And, and clearly Friedman started that, but I think Lucas and his successors were very, very influential for very powerful intellectual reasons. They were very brilliant people. Um, and the second thing is it really seemed to work, right? We had a wonderful period. We, we as I have a quotation in my book from a man whom I actually I greatly admire, uh, ben Bernanke, uh, a very famous speech in which he uh, talks about the glories of the great moderation. And, and claims the successes of the great moderation as successes for, as it were, him in mm -hmm. his capacity or them in their capacity as central bankers. You know, we had delivered something. And in that context, the assumption was, you know, macro stability was working, worked. Uh, the, the economy was basically a flexible adjustment mechanism. It would, it would move towards equilibrium. And in that context, the financial sector was just not going to do anything seriously wrong. Uh, it was just part of that system. And I think it worked so well um, and for so long that the potential risks were just not perceived until Martin, it happened. So, so let, me, let me push a little harder on the inner Martin. So, so many of these issues you've raised and other ones like UK and Europe, you know, you, you have to churn out your two columns a week, and these issues, like you said, with global imbalances, don't go away. Um, and occasionally it must be a little frustrating that, that 
the powers that be don't just roll over and say, okay, I read Martin on this for the sixth time. This time I get it. I'm going to change my mind. So how, how do you motivate yourself when you're, in a sense, having to grapple with the same big issues over and over and over? Is it you just get angry every time? Is it hope springs eternal that you'll figure out the right chart to get through? What, what motivates you but to But just think how terrible decisions? it would be if, if they all did what I asked, then, then, then I'd have nothing to write anymore. Ah, I mean, okay. this, would be, this, would be, this would be truly, truly, uh, truly awful. Uh, so you're asking, I mean, I do this because mm -hmm. it's interesting and enjoyable and sorting out my own ideas is really the main thing I'm trying to do. I, I don't really have any uh, delusions about changing other people's minds. Uh, it's very difficult to change anybody's mind. I, I, I know that, um, uh, uh, particularly if their interests go strongly in the opposite direction. So, so the, I don't see that as uh, the adjective. I usually am not very angry. Uh, uh, it's not my temperament, uh, only in extreme circumstances. And as I said, it would be very, very aw awkward if suddenly everybody said, well, you've been right all along and we're going to do what you want. And, th and so that would be almost frightening. Uh, so um, Almost. Almost frightening. But the, the other point is the world changes. The things that matter to me change. What I think about these things change. Uh, I find um, there are columnists who never change their minds about anything. I think that gets fairly dull after a while. I do perhaps change my mind too frequently. I don't know. So in the end, what drives me is that this is all just very, very interesting and important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so having the opportunity to write for a paper like mine about things that seem to me interesting and important, and even to be paid a little for it, uh, it's just an unbelievable privilege. That's, that's how I feel about it. I've had an unbelievable privilege to take you through this conversation, as I think the people in this room have. Let me, let me throw you one last, in American terms, I hope softball, but an interesting one. Um, one of the things which you've, you've been noted for, and your paper's been noted for, is you're sort of the love-hate object of, of the Euro area. You know, uh, they, they want to be covered in the FT, they view you as the global voice on Europe, but at the same time, they're constantly complaining and frustrated. You're unfair to Europe. You're too skeptical in Europe. You're this, you're that. You're. When you were kind enough to premiere the shifts and the shocks in Washington at the Peterson Institute, Jean-Claude Trichet happened to show up. I may have arranged that. And uh, pressed you a bit on, on you know, the ongoing strength of the euro. So I guess as we close out and go back to our European Davos meeting, you know, have you changed your mind at all on Britain and Europe or on stability of the euro area? Or is it all just a matter of countdown till this is, till this is all done? I make three points. First, by British standards, I know this is not a very good answer. The FT yeah, is I a know, wildly yeah. pro-European yeah, 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 paper. Yeah, we understand. <laughs> uh, and we are criticized for it, for it yes. fiercely all yes. the time. And John Boehner is an environmentalist by American standards. Yeah. You know, it's OK, fine. No, I wouldn't get that. That's a slightly <laughs> unfair comparison. Uh, and we remain very strongly pro-membership uh, of the EU, I think, as a paper, and I certainly do. Uh, we have changed our position on British membership of the Euro. We had a long period when the FT argued very strongly for British membership of the Euro, and I mostly thought we were wrong. So we, we have, I've, they, one of the great privileges of writing at the FT is that I'm allowed to write columns which are absolutely against the op-ed, the editorial line for years, and everybody's very nice about it. Doesn't happen at the journal, in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, and uh, so uh, we've, we've had that balance. Vis-a-vis, -vis, that's a sort of second point, uh, um, and we will remain there. We are very strongly membership. But we do have a, an Anglo view, there's no doubt, we do. On the comments we've made about the Euro, um, uh, I think I've tried to strike a balance, but it might not be seen as that, between what I think of as the views of the North and the South, as it were. Um, and, and I think that's what the paper has tried to do, because I think there is a, an element of, of truth in the views of both. So I've even written some columns, I can cite them actually, in which I've been rather sympathetic to the German position, and then sometimes rather less so. But we have probably balanced somewhat against 
the northern position mm -hmm. because it's the, the dominant one. It's the overwhelmingly dominant one in practice. And it seems to me somebody has to argue against it. Um, and I'm very, and because of who we are and where we are, we can do that. So I regard it as, uh, as in the context of what we've done within the euro as being, or about the euro issue, as sort of being, in a way, what we would call in Britain the loyal opposition. We want, and this is very true in a very important way, which is, um, th though I'm not sure where this project will end up, I have no idea at all, um, but my view has always consistently been that it would be far better if it were made a success than not. We have not called for breakup, as, uh, as many have outside the Eurozone. And we want to make it work. And we actually, the only reason I've written the columns I've written, including the one this morning, is that I fear that this is not a stable situation we're in now. And the stability is because, the, and the concern I have is that it seems to me the strategies are now being pursued are ones that put inordinate stress on an unbelievably important but at the same time fragile structure. So I'm perfectly happy with the position we've adopted, even though I know people uh, disagree violently and think we're pretty bad people, but that's part of being a journalist. You have to live with that. And we will live with it. We'll stop it there with Martin Wolf, author of Latedly of the Shifts and the Shocks, Chief Financial Com Chief Economics Commentator of the Financial Times, which he's holding up, if not of the world. So thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.